This year marks the golden anniversary of Father John Courtney Murray's We Hold These Truths, Catholic Reflections on, American, on the American Proposition. Arguably the most important such reflection composed in our time, and perhaps in any time. Its publication landed Father Murray, an urbane New York Jesuit, on the cover of Times, Time magazine, in the days when that distinction, like the Nobel Peace Prize, actually meant something. The opening paragraphs of Mary's book summarize its argument and give the flavor of his cool, dry, rhetorical style. Quote, It is classic American doctrine, immortally asserted by Abraham Lincoln, that the new nation which our founders brought forth on this continent was dedicated to a proposition. Quote, I take it that Lincoln used the word with conceptual propriety. In philosophy, a proposition is the statement of a truth to be demonstrated. In mathematics, a proposition is at times the statement of an operation to be performed. Our fathers dedicated the nation to a proposition in both of these senses. The American proposition is at once doctrinal and practical, a theorem and a problem. It is an affirmation and also an intention. It presents itself as a coherent structure of thought that lays claim to intellectual assent. It also presents itself as an organized political project that aims at historical success. Our fathers asserted it and most ably argued it. They also took to work it out and they signally succeeded. Today, when civil war has become the basic fact of world society, there's no element of the theorem that is not menaced by active negation and no thrust of the project that does not meet powerful opposition. Today, therefore, thoughtful men among us are saying that America must be more clearly conscious of what it proposes, more articulate in proposing, more purposeful in the realization of the project proposed. This American proposition, as Mary understood it, was a conservation by development of the political dimension of the Western civilizational project that had emerged over the centuries from the fruitful interaction of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome, that is, of biblical religion, Greek rationality, and Roman law. Mary's theory of democracy, while seeming thin to some of his critics, was thus far thicker than that of today's democratic functionalists, whose sole concern is to get the machinery of governments right. Mary, by contrast, thought of politics not as a machinery, but as deliberation, common deliberation, among men and women who were citizens and not merely bundles of desires. Nor, contrary to others of his critics, was Mary's democratic theory overly dependent on a Hobbesian or Lockean construal of civil society. We no longer believe, with Locke or Hobbes, that man escapes from a mythical state of nature, by an act of will, by a social contract. Civil society is a need of human nature before it becomes the object of human choice. Moreover, every particular society is a creation of the soil. It springs from the physical soil of earth and from the more formative soil of history. Its ideals are expressed in legends that go beyond the facts and are for that reason vehicles of truth. Nevertheless, the distinctive bond of civil society is reason, or more exactly, that exercise of reason which is argument. No true city and certainly no true democracy, is possible if everything is in doubt. If there's to be genuine argument, and not just cacophony or the will to power, there must be, Mary wrote, a core of agreement, accord, concurrence, acquiescence, end of quote. Because only if certain truths are held can there be genuine arguments. Much of modernity, Mary knew, had this exactly backwards, thinking that argument ends when agreement is reached. The opposite is more fundamentally true in both the sciences and the humanities. Real argument is only possible 
within a pre-existing context of agreement on certain truths. Murray distinguished the Anglo-American political tradition from the Jacobinism of continental European political philosophy. The latter began its thinking about politics with autonomous human reason. The former looked, quote, to the sovereignty of God as to the first principle of its organization. In the American proposition, in other words, rights were rooted in the dignity of the human person as capable of rational moral choice and considered political judgment. Rights were acknowledged in law to facilitate the promotion and defense of the common good, not simply to protect individual choice. The state is distinct from society and limited in its offices toward society. Society exists prior to the state, ontologically as well as historically. And the state exists to serve society, not the other way around. But the salient point, as Mary put it, was that government, rightly understood, quote, submits itself to judgment by the truth of society. It is not itself a judge of the truth in society. Elections in America take place regularly, however vulgarly. Public officials are rotated in and out of office, if not as often as some would like. <coughs> Initiatives and referenda repair the damage that the people's inherent sense of justice tells them has been done to the common good by legislatures or courts. Free speech and freedom of the press are robust, if often shallow. But the barbarians are among us on this front, too. The most obvious instance of an assault on the principle of consent is what a First Things Symposium termed in 1996 the judicial usurpation of politics. This violation of a constituting truth of the American proposition was most egregious in Roe versus Wade the degree to which the Supreme Court got it colossally wrong in Roe can be measured by the degree to which the effects of Roe have roiled our public life ever since. Just as in the past, the court's colossal mistakes in Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson distorted our public life for decades. That the third truth within the proposition, namely that the state exists to serve society which is ontologically and historically antecedent to the state, has become attenuated in its grip on our public culture, seems clear from two recent controversies. The first involved President Obama's commencement address this past May at the University of Notre Dame. It's beyond the scope of this lecture to explore the question of whether Notre Dame violated its own commitments as a Catholic institution of higher learning by holding up this president as an exemplar and by granting him an honorary degree of laws. My focus here is on what the president said, which was most remarkable and most disturbing. There, the president leapt into the middle of the decades-long ecclesiological debate within the Catholic Church in the US by suggesting that the good Catholics, the real Catholics, were men like Father Theodore Hesburgh and the late Cardinal Joseph Bernardin, and indeed all those Catholics who supported the Obama candidacy in 2008 and agreed with the president on the nature of the common ground to be sought in American public life. President Obama, in other words, would be the arbiter of authentic Catholicism in America. The Catholic Church can take care of itself and is doing so in the face of this challenge. What I wish to underscore here is the gravity of the threat that the president's Notre Dame commencement address posed to the fabric of religious freedom in America which is one constitutional expression of the third truth of the American proposition and its understanding of the relationship of society and the state. The White House likely thought it was simply playing wedge politics, strengthening its grip on certain Catholic constituencies while driving a wedge between those Catholics and their bishops. But there was nothing simple about this. Here was the state embodied by the president claiming a purchase in what had for centuries been understood to be the inviolable territory of society.